Hello and welcome to Baiju's IAS. Before we begin, let me wish everyone a very happy Independence Day in advance. And let me also remind you that tomorrow being a public holiday, we won't be having the Hindu analysis. So with this, let's get started with the analysis of today's The Hindu newspaper, beginning with an article from the front page of the Delhi edition. The Prime Minister has launched the Transparent Taxation Platform with the objective of honouring the honest taxpayer. This transparent taxation platform provides for three tax-related services. This includes faceless assessment, faceless appeal and a charter for the taxpayer and as well as a charter for the tax authorities. See, the taxes that we pay is one of the most important sources of revenue to the government. The government makes use of this money in nation-building activities such as socio-economic welfare programs, creation of infrastructure, defense of the country, etc. So to further promote nation building, one of the objectives of the government is to generate more revenue through taxes. But this requires the taxpayers to pay their taxes on time with honesty and the government and the tax authorities need to take a number of steps in order to widen or expand the tax base. But one of the challenges in India's taxation system is that it is quite complicated. A lot of taxpayers find it difficult to understand the taxation system and they even try to evade paying taxes. There are other taxpayers who are willing to pay the taxes but they find the system complicated because of the complexities involved in the process of assessment, appeal, returns, etc. Then there are a lot of taxpayers who pay their taxes honestly on time but they are not recognized for it. This hesitation and complexity seen on the side of the taxpayer ends up giving a lot of discretionary powers to the taxation authorities. It also leads the tax authorities to treat every taxpayer as a dishonest taxpayer and this ends up putting the fear of the tax authority in the mind of the taxpayer. So essentially, the relationship between the taxpayer and the tax authorities has become quite complicated and this directly affects government's revenue collection. So in order to reduce the discretionary powers of the taxation authorities, and in order to instill greater confidence amongst the taxpayers and treat the honest taxpayers with respect, the Prime Minister has launched the Transparent Taxation Platform with the stated objective of honouring the honest taxpayer. Under this taxation platform, faceless assessment and faceless appeal has been provided for, which tries to eliminate the interaction between the taxpayer and the tax authorities. Then under the platform, a taxpayer's charter has also been brought out along with the charter for the tax authorities as well, which clearly defines the rights and the responsibilities of the taxpayer and as well as the tax authorities. These reforms being introduced to direct taxation is expected to widen the tax base and promote tax buoyancy, which in turn is expected to increase government's revenue collection. The taxpayer's charter, which was promised in this year's budget, has been brought out and it lays down a set of rights and responsibilities for the taxpayer. Under the charter, the taxpayer is expected to be honest and compliant and pay their taxes on time and respond to all notices and requests by the tax authorities. The taxpayer is also expected to keep himself informed about the taxation system and maintain accurate records. The charter also promises the taxpayer to protect them from any harassment by the tax authorities and it also promises to provide for a simplified taxation system. The charter also lays down a set of duties and responsibilities for the tax authorities. It mandates the tax authorities to be fair and reasonable while dealing with taxpayers and it mandates them to treat every taxpayer as an honest taxpayer unless and until there is evidence to raise any suspicion. Because see, under the previous taxation system, every taxpayer used to be treated as a dishonest taxpayer by the tax authorities. Basically, the taxation system was inclined towards treating every taxpayer as a dishonest taxpayer. Now, the government is working towards changing this perception and it mandates the tax authorities to honour the honest taxpayers and treat them with respect and treat every taxpayer as a potential honest taxpayer. This will help in promoting a change in mindset amongst the tax authorities and it will help in preventing the unnecessary harassment of the honest taxpayer by the tax authorities. The Charter also mandates the tax authorities to take timely decisions, to respect the privacy of the taxpayer, to maintain confidentiality as they have access 
to sensitive and confidential information belonging to the taxpayer. It also promises to hold the tax authorities accountable in case of any corruption or harassment. It mandates the tax authorities to establish a platform through which complaints, appeals and grievances could be received. And it expects the tax authorities to resolve these complaints and appeals by establishing a fair and just system that can help resolve these disputes. Then apart from the Charter, the Faceless Assessment and Faceless Appeal System has been designed to reduce the interaction between the taxpayer and the tax authority. This is expected to promote greater transparency and accountability in the taxation system and reduce the harassment of the honest taxpayers and put an end to any possible corrupt practices of the tax authorities and provide for a hassle-free tax payment experience for the taxpayer. See, as per the existing taxation system, various income tax offices located in various zones, they have their own territorial jurisdiction. So the tax authorities posted in these tax offices, they would be dealing with all the tax related cases arising out of this jurisdiction. So this was creating an opportunity for an interaction between the tax authority and the taxpayer. And since the tax authorities used to generally treat every taxpayer as a dishonest taxpayer, it was leading to their unnecessary harassment and possible corrupt practices on the part of the tax authorities. So in order to eliminate this physical interaction completely between the tax authorities and the taxpayer, a faceless system has been proposed and accordingly, the faceless assessment system has already come into force from yesterday. Then by September 25th, the faceless appeal system shall also be implemented. This faceless system is driven by technology and it is based on data analytics, artificial intelligence and a centralized database. Basically under this system, a centralized database of all the cases shall be created and the cases shall be allocated at random to various income tax offices and this random allocation shall be done by using data analytics and artificial intelligence. So henceforth, the territorial jurisdiction of IT offices shall not exist and instead IT cases from one part of the country shall be allocated at random to some IT office located in a different zone. So this technology driven faceless platform will completely eliminate the need for interaction between the tax authorities and the taxpayer and thereby reduces the possibility of corruption. It provides for a hassle free experience for the taxpayer and it also promotes transparency and accountability. This faceless system of assessment and appeal will also reduce the need to frequently transfer the tax authorities because the concept of territorial jurisdiction does not exist anymore. Earlier, the tax authorities would be transferred frequently to different jurisdictions in order to prevent them from getting comfortable and in order to prevent them from harassing a set of taxpayers who might have become familiar to them because of the constant face-to-face -face interaction that they used to have. So under the earlier system, tax authorities would be frequently transferred to different jurisdictions in order to tackle corruption. But with the faceless system, the need for frequent transfers will be completely eliminated and it also provides the taxpayer with a seamless, painless and faceless experience that also takes forward the government's agenda of minimum government, maximum governance. Now let's take up an article from page number 4. Political parties and community groups from Arunachal Pradesh have revived the demand for bringing the entire state under the sixth schedule of the Indian constitution. They have demanded the center to provide for the establishment of two autonomous councils in Arunachal Pradesh by bringing the state under the sixth schedule of the constitution or at least provide the state with greater autonomy as provided to Nagaland under Article 371A of the Indian Constitution. See, Arunachal Pradesh has predominantly tribal population and it is also a frontier state that shares a border with three countries. Arunachal Pradesh has an international border with China, Bhutan and Myanmar. So the predominance of tribal population, the difficult terrain and the remoteness of the region makes it difficult for promoting socio-economic development in Arunachal Pradesh and for protecting the special interests of the tribal population. Currently, Arunachal Pradesh is covered under the fifth schedule of the constitution and it also has a few special provisions under Article 371H. Under Article 371H, the governor of the state acquires special powers with regard to law and order in the state and as well as with regard to protection of the customary laws that are unique to the tribal communities. But political parties and community groups from Arunachal have been arguing that 
these special powers that have been currently provided to Arunachal Pradesh under the constitution are not sufficient and hence they are demanding the state to be brought under the sixth schedule of the constitution. See the Indian constitution provides for a number of special provisions for areas that predominantly have a tribal population. Such tribal areas can be declared as scheduled areas or as tribal areas as per the provisions of article 244 which provides for the fifth schedule and the sixth schedule of the Indian constitution. These states having tribal areas and scheduled areas also enjoy special provisions under article 371a to article 371j. Most of these special provisions have been designed to provide greater political and legislative autonomy to these regions so that the unique customary laws, the unique culture, language, the land and the resources of the tribal communities can be protected and this can provide for socio-economic development in the tribal areas and the scheduled areas. But the autonomy and the special provisions provided under the sixth schedule of the constitution is far greater than the special provisions and the autonomy provided under the fifth schedule. See article 244 of the Indian constitution says that the provisions of the fifth schedule shall apply to the scheduled areas in every state other than Meghalaya, Tripura, Assam and Mizoram. Because the tribal areas of these four states have been covered separately under the sixth schedule of the Indian constitution as defined under article 244 clause 2. So please note that article 244 clause 1 and the fifth schedule of the Indian constitution deals with the scheduled areas whereas article 244 clause 2 and the sixth schedule they deal with the tribal areas present in these four states. See both scheduled areas under fifth schedule and the tribal areas under the sixth schedule they have a predominance of tribal population. The only difference is that in the degree of autonomy that has been granted to them. See under the fifth schedule the president of India is empowered to declare or establish a scheduled area in any state but as we discussed these provisions of the fifth schedule does not apply for Assam, Meghalaya, Mizoram and Tripura. Once the president notifies the establishment of a fifth schedule area in a state then the governor of the state acquires a few special powers. Basically the executive powers of the union gets extended to the scheduled areas. This allows the union government to give directions to the state government regarding the administration of these scheduled areas and it also provides for the establishment of a tribal advisory council which shall be constituted by the state government in consultation with the governor and this council shall consist of not more than 20 members from the tribal communities and they shall advise the state government and the governor in the interest of promoting the advancement and welfare of the scheduled area. As mentioned the governor of such a state acquires a few special powers and he has to submit a report to the president annually and he is also empowered to state that any law passed by the state government or by the parliament does not apply to the scheduled areas. But as you can see even though the fifth schedule provides for a few special provisions it does not provide for any political or legislative autonomy. It only extends certain executive powers of the union and it provides for the establishment of a tribal advisory council and provides few special powers to the governor. But unlike the scheduled areas of the fifth schedule, the tribal areas of the sixth schedule, they enjoy greater autonomy. These tribal areas are located in the four states that is Assam, Meghalaya, Tripura and Mizoram and once the president declares the establishment of a tribal area under the sixth schedule, the center and the state can provide for the establishment of autonomous districts which shall be governed by district councils and regional councils. Even though these autonomous councils fall under the overall executive authority of the state, they enjoy a lot of autonomy and these councils have been provided with administrative, legislative and even financial autonomy. In some cases, the autonomous councils also enjoy a certain degree of judicial autonomy as well. So this allows the autonomous councils to impose and collect their own taxes, to provide for local administration and prevent the imposition of any laws passed by the state government or by the parliament in the interest of protecting the customary laws of the tribal community and as well as the unique culture language of the tribal community and it provides for a great deal of administrative, legislative and financial autonomy to these councils to take care of the socio-economic welfare of the region. Such autonomous councils have come up in 10 tribal areas under the sixth schedule. This includes the Kasi Hills Autonomous District Council, the Jaintia Hills Autonomous District Council and the Garo Hills Autonomous District Council of Meghalaya, 
then in Mizoram, we have autonomous district councils for the Chakmas and the Lai and as well as for the Mara tribe. Then in Tripura, the tribal areas have been given a separate autonomous district. And in Assam, we have separate autonomous councils for the Dima Hasao, the Karbi Anglong and the Bodo land region. So these 10 six scheduled areas enjoy a greater degree of autonomy, which is otherwise not available to the scheduled areas under the fifth schedule. And hence, political parties and community groups from Arunachal Pradesh have been demanding the six scheduled status or at least a few special provisions similar to the one that has been extended to Nagaland under Article 371A. Now let's take up an editorial from page number 6 that deals with the topic of child labour. See, child labour in general is seen as a social curse around the world because the practice of child labour directly affects the well-being of the child and the healthy development of the child. It denies the child access to education, it denies the child the right access to nutrition and as well as deprives them of the right emotional and physical care. So in order to combat this social menace, the International Labour Organization has two important conventions against child labour. This includes Convention 182 that deals with the worst forms of child labour and Convention 138 that is the minimum age convention which sets a threshold age for work. See amongst all forms of child labour, the most dangerous is hazardous child labour. This includes the trafficking of children in order to push them into forced prostitution. It includes the deployment of children in armed conflict as child soldiers and it also includes the employment of children in various hazardous industries. So in order to combat hazardous child labour and the worst forms of child labour, the ILO came out with Convention 182. This convention was adopted in 1999 and it prohibits sexual exploitation of children, it prohibits trafficking of children, their deployment in armed conflict and as well as other hazardous forms of child labour which can affect the well-being of the child and the healthy development of the child. Convention 182 is complemented by the Minimum Age Convention which was adopted in 1973 and it is also known as Convention 138. As I mentioned, this convention sets a minimum threshold age for work in order to prevent the practice of child labour. These two conventions have been at the forefront of our fight against child labour and it mandates all the countries that have ratified these two conventions to implement suitable laws in order to abolish child labour, especially worst forms of child labour. The widespread adoption of these two conventions has prevented millions of children around the world from being employed in hazardous work environments. Subsequently, these two conventions have directly contributed to a significant increase in the enrollment of children in education. This editorial dealing with child labour and Convention 182 has been published because Convention 182 has recently achieved universal ratification. Recently, the Kingdom of Togo ratified Convention 182 and with this, all the UN member states have ratified Convention 182 and this is the first time in the history of International Labour Organization that a convention has been universally ratified. See, the International Labour Organization has adopted eight fundamental conventions. They deal with various issues of labour, such as fundamental principles and rights at work, freedom of association, the right to collective bargaining, elimination of discrimination in employment and occupation, etc. Out of these eight conventions, two of the most important conventions are Convention 182 and Convention 138. And amongst these eight fundamental conventions, Convention 182 has become the first convention of the ILO to achieve universal ratification. So this in itself is a cause for celebration because it is a landmark moment. But however, there is still an enormous challenge that lies ahead of us to abolish child labour completely. Because according to UN reports, we still have around 152 million children around the world who are employed as child labourers. And out of this, 72 million of them are still working in hazardous work environments. We still have millions of children around the world who are being trafficked, who are being pushed into forced prostitution and who are being employed as child soldiers. So if the global community has to achieve its ambitious goal of total abolition of child labour by 2025, then further efforts are needed by the global institutions such as the ILO, the United Nations and as well as by national governments in order to tackle this social menace and ensure that 
children are rightfully enrolled into the education system. Even though India has made considerable progress with regard to abolition of child labor, it is still lagging behind and it was only in 2017 that India ratified both the conventions. So India and the global community will have to strive harder in order to abolish child labor completely and they will have to take into account the disruption that has been caused by the COVID-19 pandemic to education and employment around the world. Next, we have an article on page number 9 that deals with cybersecurity cooperation between India and Australia. See, recently we spoke about the virtual summit that India and Australia held at the level of Prime Ministers. During this virtual interaction, India and Australia elevated their ties to the strategic level by signing the Comprehensive Strategic Partnership. Under this strategic framework, one of the key agreements that was signed between India and Australia was the Cyber Enabled Critical Technology Framework Agreement. Because this agreement promotes greater coordination between India and Australia in the domain of cyber security. Two senior Australian diplomats have pointed out that as a result of this agreement, India and Australia can jointly work together to protect their critical infrastructure from cyber attacks. And Australia, which specializes in cyber security, can assist India by sharing relevant technologies. The diplomats have observed that Australia can also help India in the regulatory domain by assisting India to come up with encryption laws that can effectively tackle cybercrime. That both the countries share a common concern with regard to China's role in threatening the cybersecurity of the other countries. Since Australia closely allies with the United States, it has taken a similar stand on the involvement of Chinese companies in the rollout of 5G technology. Even Australia sees the involvement of China's Huawei and ZTE in the rollout of 5G technology as a national security threat and it has prohibited the involvement of Chinese companies in the upcoming 5G network of Australia. And on the other hand, India for the time being has allowed Chinese companies to take part in 5G trials. But the recent border clashes between India and China has led India to take a tougher stand against Chinese companies, especially Chinese technology companies. Recently, India banned numerous Chinese mobile applications on the grounds of national security and it is also expected to take a tougher stand on the involvement of Huawei networks in the rollout of 5G technology. So these common concerns and strategic alignment between the two countries can promote greater cooperation in the cybersecurity domain and this can not only help in protecting their critical infrastructure and their national security interests but it can also help in driving digital trade between the two countries. Now let's take up an article from page number 9 that deals with India's relations with Maldives. See, India has announced a $500 million economic package for Maldives in order to help the island country overcome the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. See, as you all know, Maldives is a small island country located strategically in the Indian Ocean region and it is made up of thousands of islands known as atolls. So in such a country where the islands are distributed, connectivity is a major problem, that is intra-island connectivity. The unique geography of Maldives also poses a challenge with regard to telecom and internet connectivity as well. And being a small island country, its economy is not well diversified and Maldives is heavily dependent on tourism in order to sustain itself. But as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, tourism and air travel has taken a massive hit and as a result, Maldives' economy has been suffering severely over the last few months. So India being one of the closest partners of Maldives, it has come to its assistance and it has announced an economic package of $500 million. Out of this, $100 million shall be in the form of a grant or aid that need not be repaid by Maldives and the other $400 million shall be a line of credit which is basically a concessional loan that Maldives will have to pay back at a later date on concessional terms. This financial assistance of India is in addition to the $800 million that India had earlier announced as a part of another line of credit in 2018. So let us quickly talk about the infrastructure projects that shall be funded through this economic package. This fund shall be used to restore air connectivity between India and Maldives and as well as intra-island connectivity within Maldives by establishing dedicated air bubbles. It will also be used to establish direct ferry service between the several islands of Maldives and India will be funding the laying of a submarine OFC cable in order to promote telecom and internet connectivity in Maldives. 
But the most important infrastructure project that India would be taking up in Maldives would be the Greater Male Connectivity Project. See, this project has been labelled as the largest civilian infrastructure project of Maldives. It proposes to connect Male, the capital of Maldives, with three neighbouring islands and this is expected to give a major boost to the local economy and tourism. So this project shall involve the construction of several bridges and India shall be playing a critical role in this project. So the announcement of this initiative represents a major improvement in the India-Maldives relationship under the leadership of Ibrahim Soleil. If you remember, we have discussed in previous sessions as to how India's ties with Maldives had deteriorated under the previous president Yamin Kayum. Between 2012 and 2018, Maldives went through a major political crisis during which Maldives turned entirely pro-China and Indian interests were completely compromised under the leadership of President Yamin Kayu. It was during this period that the involvement of India's GMR in the construction of Malay Airport was cancelled and this project was handed over to a Chinese company. China even sponsored the construction of the Sinamalay Bridge that you can see in this image over here which is also referred to as the China-Maldives Friendship Bridge. So this increasing involvement of China in Maldives infrastructure projects was seen as a strategic threat for India. But the recent defeat of Yamin Gayoom in the 2018 elections and the election of Ibrahim Soleil as the new president of Maldives has come as a huge relief to India because Ibrahim Soleil has made it clear that under his leadership, Maldives would try to balance its relations with both India and China. The results are already clearly evident. India's relations has again improved with Maldives and India is again playing a key role in the critical infrastructure projects of Maldives. Now let's take up an article from page number 14, which refers to a major development in West Asia. The United Arab Emirates and Israel have established formal diplomatic ties with the mediation of the United States. See, all the Gulf and Arab countries have been opposed to Israel on the Palestinian issue. But with the establishment of diplomatic ties between UAE and Israel, UAE has become the first Gulf country and the third Arab state to formally establish diplomatic ties with Israel. This gives greater legitimacy to Israel in the region because it is a well-known fact that Israel and a few Gulf and Arab states have developed close covert relations. Countries like UAE, even though they have autocratic rulers, they are seen as a beacon of tolerance and stability by the Western countries and the establishment of official ties with Israel further strengthens its image in the region. But UAE has agreed to establish diplomatic ties on one condition. The condition is that Israel had to abandon its controversial annexation plan of West Bank. See, Israel's Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu had proposed the West Bank annexation plan. As per this plan, Israel was looking to annex some of the Palestine areas and promote the legalization of the existing illegal Jewish settlements and also provide for the construction of newer Jewish settlements. In return, the Palestinian areas were supposed to be given only limited autonomy, which goes completely against the UN partition plan or the two-state solution, under which Israel was supposed to grant Palestine complete sovereignty, leading to the establishment of Palestine as an independent country for Palestinian Muslims. But over the years, Israel has been looking to undercut the demands for independence from Palestinians by weakening the diplomatic and covert support that they enjoyed from Gulf and Arab states with the help of the Western countries such as the United States. So Israel has agreed to suspend the annexation plans of West Bank as per the conditions of the UAE and as a result, both the countries have established official diplomatic ties. Now let's take up the practice questions for today. Which of the following can be considered as the environmental impact of urban landfills? Contamination of groundwater or aquifers, soil contamination, climate change. All the three are correct. Option D is the right answer. See, solid waste that is generated in urban areas is usually dumped in these landfills. And since they contain a number of hazardous contaminants, they can leach over a period of time and contaminate the groundwater and as well as the soil. And through partial decomposition, they also release greenhouse gases such as methane and carbon dioxide which can further accelerate global warming and climate change. This question has been asked because we have an article on page number 5 that makes a reference to an urban landfill. Now let's take up the next question. Which of the following statements are correct? The Official Languages Act 1963 stipulates that 
Central government must publish notifications only in Hindi and English. It does not provide for publication in all the official languages recognized under the 8th schedule of the constitution. Both the statements are correct. Option D is the right answer. This question has been asked because according to this article on page number 10, the Chief Justice of India has asked the Indian government to amend the Official Languages Act of 1963 in order to include more vernacular languages for publishing government notifications instead of confining itself to just Hindi and English. Now let's take up the next question. Which of the following statements are incorrect? The Indian Navy has recently set up a Naval Innovation and Indigenous Organization to bridge its technological gap through innovation. It provides for the involvement of both the academia and the industry. Its establishment is in line with the draft defense acquisition policy of 2020. All the three statements are correct. So option D is the right answer because the question is asking you to identify the incorrect statements. Since all the statements are correct, option D would be the right answer. This question has been asked because according to this article on page number 11, the defense minister has launched the Naval Innovation and Indigenous Organization under the Indian Navy in order to promote the indigenous design and development of naval platforms and naval armaments. This organization will promote India's self-reliance in the field of naval technology through indigenization and by fostering innovation through regular interaction between the academia and the industry. The Naval Innovation and Indigenous Organization will be a three-tiered organization and it shall consist of the Naval Technology Acceleration Council. This council shall promote innovation and indigenization then under this, there will be a working group to implement the projects taken up by the Technology Acceleration Council. And there shall also be a Naval Technology Development Acceleration Cell in order to promote the induction of disruptive technologies into the Navy. Now let's take up the next question. Which of the following statements are correct? African swine fever is reported only in Sub-Saharan Africa. It infects natural hosts such as ticks, which in turn act as vectors and they later infect pigs and other animals. It is not known to affect human beings. Amongst the given statements, the first statement is incorrect. See, the African swine fever is endemic to Africa, especially Sub-Saharan Africa. But it has also spread to large parts of Europe, Asia and as well as to Northeast of India. So the correct answer would be option D, 2 and 3 only. This question has been asked because according to this article on page number 11, Meghalaya has been hit by African swine fever. Now let's take up the next question. Which of the following statements are correct? Araku Valley is a popular hill station in Telangana. It is nestled in the Eastern Ghats bordering Vishakapatnam. It is known for its coffee plantations and is inhabited by a number of tribes. Amongst the given statements, the first statement is incorrect. So option B is the right answer. Because see the Araku Valley is located in Andhra Pradesh, not in Telangana. This question has been asked because we have an article on page number 12 that refers to the coffee plantations of the Araku Valley in Andhra Pradesh. Now let's take up the next question. Which countries are involved in the emerging tensions in the Mediterranean region over the recent discovery of gas reserves? The correct answer is option A. It is Greece, Cyprus and Turkey. See, large volumes of gas reserves are known to be present in the Eastern Mediterranean region. In fact, Israel, Greece, and Cyprus have already signed an agreement to establish the Eastern Mediterranean Gas Pipeline, also known as the Eastern Triangle, with the support of the European Union. Recently, new gas reserves have been discovered in and around Cyprus, which falls within the exclusive economic zone of Cyprus. But Turkey has laid claims to these gas reserves because Turkey does not recognize the provisions of the UN clause. It does not recognize the exclusive economic zone as defined by UN clause because Turkey defines its EEZ on the basis of continental shelf. So the entry of Turkish drilling vessels into the EEZ of Cyprus has led to a dispute between the Republic of Cyprus and Turkey and even Greece has become a party to the dispute. Of late, tensions have been increasing between these three countries as they have threatened to use military force against each other and this has led France, which is a key player in the region, to deploy its naval forces into the Eastern Mediterranean. Now let's take up the next question. Hamas is a fundamentalist organization that operates out of which region? The correct answer is option C, the Gaza Strip. 
See the Gaza Strip located over here is a part of the Palestinian territory. Palestine is made up of the Gaza Strip and the West Bank and it is a disputed region because back in 1947 Israel defied the two-state solution of the UN which was seeking to establish Israel and Palestine as two independent countries for the Jews and the Palestinian Muslims. Israel went on to declare unilateral independence in 1948 and it went on to occupy large parts of Palestinian territory while waging multiple conflicts with Arab states and the Gulf states. So today the Palestinian areas have been reduced to the Gaza Strip over here that faces the Mediterranean Sea and the West Bank located over here next to the borders with Jordan and the Dead Sea. Today the West Bank falls under the administration of the Palestinian Authority and Gaza Strip is largely controlled by a fundamentalist outfit known as the Hamas. The Hamas is known to carry out terror attacks against Israel by firing rockets across the border and hence US, European Union and Israel recognize Hamas as a terrorist outfit. Whereas countries such as China, Russia, Iran and a few others, they extend support to Hamas and they see Hamas as a liberation organization. Whereas a few other countries, they take more of a neutral stand and they describe Hamas as just a fundamentalist militant organization. So on page number 14, we have an article which refers to the recent attacks carried out by Israel against the Gaza Strip in order to target the Hamas terror camps. Now let's take up a practice question from the 2015 prelims paper with reference to the IUCN and CITES, which of the following statements are correct? IUCN is an organ of the United Nations and CITES is an international agreement between governments. IUCN runs thousands of field projects around the world to better manage natural environments. CITES is legally binding on the states that have joined it, but this convention does not take the place of national laws. Amongst the given statements, the first statement is incorrect because the IUCN is not an organ of the UN, it is an independent organization. So the correct answer would be option B, 2 and 3 only. Finally, let's take up a couple of mains practice questions. The first question, in the backdrop of the demand of a few states to be included in the 6th schedule instead of the 5th schedule of the Indian constitution, evaluate the advantages of being included under the 6th schedule. Also compare the provisions of the 6th schedule with the 5th schedule. The second question, citing recent trends in taxation in India, discuss the advantages of expanding the tax base. Also explain the ways to improve tax buoyancy by giving examples of some recent government initiatives in this regard. Kindly write an answer to these questions and post your answers in the comment section below. So this concludes our discussion for the day. Thanks for watching.